Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining Tip of the Mint Watershed Council's Icebreaker Winter Speaker Series talk, Rolling on the Rivers. And I'm so sorry if I have covered up the title of this presentation, if you're seeing talking heads instead of the right hand side of the screen. Um, but we'll be talking today with Brian Kosminski of True North Trout. He spends a lot of time on our beautiful waters, and we're very excited to hear about his experiences. I am Jen DeMoss, the Watershed Council's Communications Director, and I'm here to introduce our speaker. Uh, this is the last Icebreaker Speakers talk uh, of our series, and we're so sad to see it go. Um, but stay tuned for more information about more events that we're going to be having. I'm really excited to turn this over to our speaker, but I wanted to give you uh, just a couple of housekeeping tips. Uh, first of all, all lines will be muted during this presentation. There will be time for questions, and we'll try to get in as many questions as we possibly can at the end of the talk. So if you have a question, go ahead and type it in in that Q&A box down there at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we might not be monitoring the chat for questions, so I wouldn't suggest putting them in there. Um, also, this webinar is being recorded, and I'll post it on our YouTube channel within a week of this event. So you should be getting an email if you've registered for this presentation within a week with uh, a link to the YouTube channel and the recording. Um, also, just a tip, if you're one of those people who doesn't like having that kind of strip of presenters on the side of your screen, you can get rid of us. Um, just hit that little rectangle right where that uh, red arrow is pointing, that little bar, and it'll get rid of us. If you want to bring back the presenter spaces, you can hit uh, one of those larger rectangles to the right of it. Um, for those of you who might be familiar with us, we are a nonprofit membership based organization with over 40 years of history protecting and improving our water resources in northern Michigan. We're dedicated to protecting our lakes, streams, wetlands, and groundwater through advocacy, education, water quality monitoring, research, and restoration activities. And we've been operating in northern Michigan for over 40 years, and our service area includes Emmett, Antrim, Charlevoix, and Sheboygan counties. And we're thrilled to be part of caretaking our region's uh, precious freshwater resources. We would also like to recognize that our service area lies within the traditional homelands of the Anishinaabek, and we will continue to work alongside them to honor and protect this area for the next seven generations. Let me move this little screen here in case it's in your way. Um, this is the last of our Icebreaker Winter Speaker Series, as I mentioned before, which is sad, but it's also wonderful because it means that slow slide into spring is upon us. So you can watch recordings of our icebreakers on our YouTube channel on the link that's at the top of the page there, or just search Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council on YouTube. Um, and again, if you've registered for this webinar, have no fear, you're going to get recordings of it. And we have recordings of our previous Icebreaker Winter Speaker Series on that YouTube channel. Uh, we've got a lot of upcoming events for you to check out that I'm going to go over very briefly because I want to get to Brian Kosminski. Um, but we've got our upcoming partnership with Beards Brewery. Uh, Beards is very generously holding a fundraiser for us and we'll have a dedicated tap uh, April through June. So please go visit them as much as possible and support and protect our waters. Uh, we're always looking for lake and stream monitors. and We've got returning and new volunteer lake and stream monitor sessions coming up in May. Um, and you can search for those events at www.watershedcouncil.org slash attend an event and get more information and sign up for those training sessions. We've got our whale of a sale. So we're gonna be having our annual sale with very gently used boats and equipment. Um, I'm sure you guys are all fans. So please come out to that July 14th through 16th. We'll have our Clean Waters Challenge August 5th through 7th. So that's basically uh, a really great way to clean our lake shores, our rivers, and our streams and win some wonderful prizes from our sponsor, Bear Cub Outfitters. We've also got our 17th Annual Lake Association Summit coming up. That's a little bit further away, September 8th through 9th. And again, all those details, all that registration information is on our website. Um, you can find more event, more about those events on that webpage. You can get email reminders and more information when you become a member of our organization by clicking the donate button at the top of our homepage. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter and learn more about upcoming events. Just search for Tip of the Mint Watershed Council. And now I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Um, we are very pleased to introduce our speaker, Brian Kosminski, known as Kaz by his friends, has been fly fishing Michigan waters for over 30 years. He's a very talented person. Originally from Grand Rapids, where the Rogue Rivers and Grand River were his home waters, his frequent trips to Grayling to fish the holy waters were not enough for him. Over a decade ago, he and his wife, Leslie, and, his, and their daughter, Simone and Camille, made up north a permanent way of life. 
A recent transplant to Boyne City now allows the Jordan, excuse me, and Boyne Rivers to become his backyard home waters. A lifetime member of Trout Unlimited and ex officio for the Miller Van Winkle chapter, he shares his passion for, re for the resources by teaching locals the art of fly tying. Uh, Cause we are so pleased to have you here today and I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you get set up. Thank you, happy to be here. And um, you and I got a chance to float the Jordan River a few, was that two years ago? It was before this whole thing went down, wasn't it? Yeah, it was wonderful. <laughs> yes. I miss those uh, days. <laughs> yes, right, but we can still get outdoors and enjoy these things. Welcome everybody, thank you for joining. Um, as Jen said, I am a fly fishing guide in Northern Michigan, go by Kaz, I run True North Trout, I have if you're looking to reach me, you can go to uh, social media, Instagram, Facebook, and I also have a YouTube page. Always looking for input on stuff that you would like to see, what you would like to learn, tips, tricks, fly tying, all the above. I, we need to get more people engaged in the outdoors. Jen and I were talking a moment ago before we started, and my original presentation on rolling the rivers was going to be that drive is uh, corrupt or something, so I can't pull it up. So we are gonna go with a second backup that I have. And let me see if I can get you to full screen. Not quite there. Jen, what do you see? Um, I think it looks good. There's um, if you go back the way it was, uh, it's a little bit smaller than regular full screen, but you can, yeah, yeah, you gotcha. can see the whole picture. Yeah, okay. thank you. So my buddy Sam and I, uh, he has wild rise and I have true north trout. Uh, we will talk about a little bit on all the rivers that we have in Michigan, but this is how we approach where we fish and what we do in, in looking at a river. Um, oops, backwards. Overall, we need to approach a river kind of like we're dissecting a, as, as an angler, I walk up to a river and, and I need to break it down into different aspects. And that's what we're gonna accomplish in this small or short presentation. We're gonna go over the differences between Michigan waters and out west waters that you see, um, the ver diversity that we have in bugs and another good reason why you should be involved with the tip of the mitt and get involved with the uh, stream surveys, stream monitoring. I am involved with the Boyne River watershed and we've also surveyed Deer Creek, Jordan, uh, the Maple, and it helps you as an angler to learn what kind of bugs that we have so that you know exactly what type of flies to be throwing. Uh, then we'll go over our setups, the gear that you need, and how to go down a river when you're fishing in a boat and or wading techniques, and then how weather affects the rivers, because obviously we're in Northern Michigan, things change very quickly. Uh, myself, Brian Koss, Sam DeYoung, Sam's in, in Petoskey. You can contact him through Wild Rise or myself through True North Trout. Uh, our first biggest difference is when you look at these photos, this tells me out west. Uh, very large open spaces, a lot of rock, not much large woody debris. And if anybody notices on those banks, there's not a whole lot of stuff for you to snag up on your back cast. Um, when you float down the Manistee, the Jordan, the Black, the Pigeon, the Sturgeon, any of our Northern Michigan rivers, the number one key characteristic that we have that you don't see out West is the amount of trees and large woody debris. This is good and bad at the same time, provides a lot of habitat for our fish and trout to live in. It also gives a lot of space, interstitial space for bugs to live, which is why many of our rivers are rich with insect life. This is a little bit more characteristic of what a Northern Michigan stream looks like. Bottom left might be on the south branch of the Asable, the top uh, I believe is the Black River in the Pigeon River State Forest, very tight closed quarters. That could be the Jordan River as well. Uh, the white snowy picture was us floating down the Manistee last winter. 
And the bottom in the traditional long style Asable boat would be on the Boardman River where you have a 23 foot long boat. It's made for two people. Those were built in the late 1800s for the logging camps to get uh, supplies to and from camp. They're very tippy. You don't stand up in them and you generally make all your casts from a seating position. They're a lot of fun. They're very unique to Michigan and they're a joy to fish out of. Highly recommend you do it at least once in your lifetime because it's a very unique experience. The bugs that we have in Michigan, mayflies, um, or called fish flies, whatever you wanna call them. Everybody has their own description. Uh, mayflies, ephemeroptera, the Latin name means to live but a day. They are a key number one food source because as a nymph, they live in the rivers all year long. When they emerge, they go through uh, incomplete metamorphosis and they will fly off to a tree as a dun, molt one more time, become sexually mature, come back to the river, over deposit their eggs, die and become spent. When they are spent, they become free high protein food items for all the trout and other animals that live in the river. I've seen carp and pike move into the mouths of many rivers, especially the Jordan, and eat a whole bunch of bugs from the night previous hatch. Our next bug category would be the caddis, the stoneflies, uh, trichoptera. Uh, they are noted by their, I'm sorry, uh, stoneflies are trichops or caddisflies, caddis and stoneflies. Okay, we have both categories. Caddisflies are noted by their tent-shaped wings where the stoneflies look a little bit more elongated like a uh, like an ant with a, a larger abdomen. Adding on dragonflies and damselflies, uh, I see a crane fly in there as well. These are all food items that can be, they're not primary food items for a trout, but they're highly, they're around all year long and especially later months when the water's warm, they become a key target. Then we move into terrestrials, August, September. We see a lot of hoppers getting very large, spiders, bees, beetles, wasps. They get blown into the water when they're on the top of a long uh, grass or weed bank and they become opportunistic food items for trout. Um, high protein, high energy, and another food item that a trout's not gonna deny. Nymphs and uh, larvae, we've got caddis larvae, Cranefly larvae, stoneflies, sow bugs. Uh, a lot of northern Michigan rivers are rich with amphipods, crustaceans. That brings up my next target. We're going to talk about meat. When we talk about meat, we're talking about small smolts, whether they're steelhead or salmon or other trout. That's a, a high food category item. And mice. So we've got more meat with chubs and leeches and crayfish. Um, the bigger a fish gets, hypothetically, we like to say once a fish reaches, let's say 13 or 14 inches, they can no longer sustain their lifestyle by eating French fries, they have to eat a Big Mac. So they no longer can sustain their lifestyle by eating nymphs, the little stoneflies and caddisflies, they have to eat a larger food item that gives them a lot more protein in return for the amount of energy expended. That's why they're gonna chase down darters, chubs, sculpins, gobies, uh, crayfish, other trout. Um, I've seen a lot of trout. We helped with the uh, Odin River when they captured the sturgeon strain brown trout. They had 4,000, they put them in a cage and after a couple of weeks, they had 2,000. After a couple of weeks, they had 1,000. They put up a big net in the fence and they found out that the fish were self cannibalizing. So the eight inch fish were eating all the four inch fish. And that's what a, a predatory fish will do to survive. When you're floating down the river, the differences in how deep your fly can get down make a big difference on what flies you're gonna be throwing. Zone A is on the surface, zone B is the two two foot range, zone C is two to five feet. And then below zone C is the deeper range below five feet, you're gonna to have to have a deep, deep sinking line. Um, your lines are gonna be appropriate, appropriately matched 
and you're going to use a heavier rod. Most people don't understand that a six weight can carry a fly of uh, a certain size where a three weight carries a much smaller fly. Those flies will be on the surface where a streamer has some weight to it and you need a heavier rod, the seven weight, eight weight to be able to lift that fly up out of the water and propel it into the next zone. Uh, this next diagram shows which lines we're using, what depth they reach and what types of flies we're, we're using to target those ranges. So the non-weighted flies, deceivers, bucktails, um, mice patterns, those are all gonna be on the surface and they can use either a floating line or a sink, sink tip line. If your fly has enough weight, you can do that on a sink tip line to allow that to get down. Zone C, we have mid-weighted flies like sex dungeons and circus peanuts, barely legals, leech patterns, stuff that's gonna get down with the line. And then when you have a fully weighted sinking line, that's gonna get everything down with a heavily weighted fly and it gets down into the zone where the fish are often hiding. People don't understand that a fish, the subsurface, the bottom of the river has a lot less volume moving cubic feet per second than the surface does. The surface has a lot of moving water where the bottom is broken up by a lot of either the logs or the rocks are slowing down the progress of that water. So most of your fish like to rest at the bottom because they're not fighting the current and expending a whole lot of energy in order to be there. Um, and that's why getting a fly down in front of them because when a fish is down in the D level and your fly is up in B, the likelihood of the fish swimming up from level D through level C all the way up to level B to get your fly means he's gonna expend 500 calories to get a, a 200 calorie item. He's not gonna do that unless it's worth his, his time and effort. Um, Jen, are you watching to see if there's any questions or are we saving that for the end? Uh, we're saving it for the end. I'm checking okay. it out though. Gotcha. Um, and of course I'm flying blind. I don't know how many people are actually out there watching or listening, but that's You okay. have got 45 people on the hook. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Okay. Next up, we're going to talk about flow as we go down the river. Uh, progression wise, we want to think about. So I'm in the, I'm in the middle of the boat and there's an angler in the front of the boat and there's an angler in the back of the boat. The person in the back of the boat has secondary water. The person in the front of the boat has virgin water, we like to call it. And I always want my angler in the front to be focusing on tomorrow and the angler in the back to be looking at yesterday. I don't want my guy in, or lady in the front of the boat to be casting it yesterday because then they miss their opp opportunity at tomorrow. They need to be casting downstream and getting the, the strip, the retrieve of the fly back to the boat where the person in the back of the boat can hit on the backside of some of these down trees and logs that the person in the front of the boat doesn't have a good angle on. Hopefully that makes sense to a lot of people. Um, this uh, diagram does a pretty good job of showing you where your fish are going to be lying in the A, B, and C regions. Your biggest fish will probably be in, let's say section C uh, because they're pretty well protected from, the, from predation. If it's a big enough fish, they don't have to worry about being taken out by a, an osprey or an eagle, but there were telemetry studies a few years ago by either U of M or MSU where a PhD student tagged 20, 20 inch brown fish, brown trout, and they found that over a lifetime, the majority of these fish didn't move more than 20 yards their entire life. A lot of people find that hard to believe, um, but when a, a large fish finds a primary lie like underneath a log where the river provides everything that he needs to survive. He needs shelter, he needs reproduction, and he needs food. So he can move out 15 feet to the left and eat a bug or eat a crayfish, move back to his home and he's safe. And he can move upstream 10 or 15 yards where there's gravel, find a mate, reproduce and spawn and go back to home. A fish, a larger fish doesn't need to go very far. This is a great spot for him to lie. And it's 
not necessarily a bad thing to take out a large fish every once in a while because that fish resides in what we call a uh, a condo and if, if a 24 inch fish is there he can be taxing the river system when we take him out that gives opportunity for a 18 or 19 inch fish that lives downstream to move in to his new residence um i saw there was a question but we'll keep that to the end um i'm looking down the rest of my screens and i don't see a next slide that's okay i am going to jump over here and what was that question that we had out there jen it is how different to dry fly fish is the Jordan and Boyne from say the Manistee north of N72 to yellow trees in the Osable holy water? A uh, really good question. And I would say the Boyne River, because it is generally a shorter, we only have six and a half miles of river before it hits the dam that a lot of those fish don't get a chance to, there's not a whole lot of summertime dry fly fishing and access becomes another issue. Um, when you fish the Jordan, you've got so much more space, a uh, lot of bugs in the summertime, that water is pretty cold. Upper Manistee is very similar to the Jordan as far as bugs and as far as habitat and the fish that we find. Um, I'm trying to find my, oh, your, your screen is kind of like on my screen, but that's okay. Did you need any help with anything? No, I'm just trying to figure out how I can bring up my Facebook page on this. Um, if you go ahead and um, reduce downsize, well, you can stop share. Yeah, stop share, and then you can open your Facebook page, have that open, and then screen share again, and it should give you the option to be able to show that. Yeah, but my bottom is not opening up. Or do you, you want me to open up your Facebook page and then I can scroll through it for you? I just need to close this page down. But I can't figure out how to do that. Here we go. Your, your bar was sharing on top of my top bar, so I couldn't see what oh, was going, okay. going on. All right, well, we can see it now. Okay. Uh, back to your question on the difference between the Upper Manistee and the Jordan. The Jordan's only, overall, the Jordan is 26 miles, and we can talk about the Jordan forever simply because uh, I'm on the Jordan probably 100 plus days a year. Um, 
the Jordan has a a nice diversity simply because the upper stretches, a lot of beaver dams, a lot of um, a lot of habitat. And then once it gets below, let's say graves, this the velocity, the gradient starts to pick up, and we see a lot more anadromous species. We're seeing more salmon, more steelhead. We're seeing a lot more species get into the river. Um, it also becomes a river that you can't wade very easily. So you've got to either float it in a boat or do it in a canoe. Um, I'm trying to get to some fishy pictures here. Um, this would be on the Manistee and we fish a lot of the yellow trees area that you were mentioning. Uh, yellow trees sees a lot of bugs and you also see not a a whole lot of people going into the yellow trees because they've got to drive down a, a dirty two track. So that seems to keep a lot of people over in the uh, the Asabo region versus the Manistee where you have to drive into some less hospitable water. Um, the bugs are great. This is also the area where Sam Day and I found uh, the Didymo last fall when we were streamer fishing. So we're trying to Pay special close attention to that so that we're not spreading anything and we're we're washing our boats washing our waders and we're making sure that we're not bringing anything home to the jordan or any other rivers um oh what else do we have there's an that's actually uh fishing on the sturgeon with my buddy dakota and sam the sturgeon is a very unique fishery. It's very similar to the Jordan, except it's the fastest river in the lower peninsula. Um, it gets a great steelhead population because it dumps into Burt Lake and there's a lot of steelhead that are in there. They also have very large browns and that's why they were using those browns for a lot of um, stocking purposes because they were very resistant to disease. They grew fast, they were healthy, and they liked uh, lotic environments as well as lentic. They did very well. And they're a very aggressive fish and grew to a, a big size. Uh, best cabin work, blah, 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 blah. This is on the Manistee. Come on. Yeah, we'll, we'll skip Christmas pictures. Um, we did a, a women's float uh, a few years ago because we want to get more women engaged in the outdoors. We took three boats out and we had lady anglers that wanted to get into the sport. We highly encourage, we need to get more people. You'll notice that my boat's on the right, Sam's is in the middle and Dakota's on the far left. Dakota has an inflatable raft the adipose named after the fatty tissue, but it's because you know, out west, when you have a hatchery fish, they cut off the adipose fin. So you can tell if it's a hatchery steelhead or if it's a wild steelhead. And we're, we're kind of looking down on stocking too much because the hatchery fish are cutting down on the wild populations. Uh, we won't get into the discussion on the Arctic grayling. It would be cool to catch grayling in Michigan once again but they're being raised in a hatchery and it takes two generations for a hatchery fish to unlearn hatchery habits. Um, when a person walks up to a hatchery fish, that fish thinks that it means food. So a shadow, whether it could be an eagle or a mongoose or an osprey, that fish wouldn't know to look and seek cover and all of a sudden he becomes lunch instead of getting lunch. Um, but the stability of the adipose, it's a wide flat bottom boat. You can stand and cast from the front and the back. There's casting braces where you're allowed to move, move about the boat and it has a, a wide open platform, which makes that very nice for floating down the river. And you can sit down and relax in the seat when you need to relax a little bit. Uh, obviously we have a little shore lunch, usually brats or something grilled. Um, Danny was in the front of the boat and she was lying to the rest of the crowd about how big of her fish she caught. She's the uh, artist out of Elk Rapids, Danny Knopf, Knopf Studios. A uh, little brown that she did catch. Um, 
Obviously, we try to do our best as we're going down the river. The past two years with the COVID pandemic has seen, rivers have seen more traffic than we've ever seen. And that's recreational as well as sport and fishing. So there's a lot more trash to be found. Every time we go down the river, we're trying to do our best to bring out as much trash as we possibly can find. Um, we need to help spread that word to everybody that not only do we need to practice better clean, cleaning our gear principles, but we also need to not bring glass on the river and to take out as much trash as we possibly can. Um, A uh, little Martin that we saw on the river that kept following us down the bank. Cold weather situations. We fish pretty much 10 months, uh, let's say nine months of the year. January, February, March, it's a little bit too cold. We're going to go out next week and see if uh, these warmer weather days make us get us excited that uh, Fishing might be good, but uh, we'll fish all the way into December until the boat launches become too difficult to access or get your boats out of. Uh, it's always a good idea to check with somebody who lives in the area to see if, you know, once one boat goes out of a boat launch and that boat is dripping a whole lot of water, that boat ramp is now covered with fresh water and it's going to turn into ice shortly if the weather, the water temperature, air temperature is cold enough. So boat number two might not have as easy of a time getting up that hill or incline. So make sure you know where you're going, where you're putting in, where you're putting out, call ahead, uh, talk with somebody from a local outfitter so that you can find out what the river conditions are. If you don't know yourself, because if you were coming up from downstate and you got all the way up here, um, it would be unfortunate that you went down the river and all of a sudden the river was iced up and you couldn't get to the access site that you needed to get your boat out of. Uh, Jordan Valley, we use Jordan Valley Outfitters. I also do the winter rafting trips with them. So it's always good to stay in touch with those guys. Uh, on the Sturgeon, you've got Bear River Paddle and you got Sturgeon Valley Outfitters. Those guys are, are pretty much on the river every day. Uh, if I were fishing in the summertime and I wanted to avoid crowds in boats, I would go hit the Black River or the upper stretches of the Pigeon. The Pigeon River is coming back after the Song of the Morning Lotus Dam release. We are still uh, seeing some sediment issues because some of those banks were collapsing uh, again last year. So there's some milt and silt going downstream from Sturgeon Valley Road. But the fishing is very good. What's really cool about the, the pigeon is it gets a nice steelhead run from the uh, Mullet Lake Reserve. Those fish like to move in from down there. Um, again, uh, this is Amber. We're trying to teach Amber how to ca ca uh, row the boat so she has a better idea. This was out in Montana when we went to pick up our boat. Uh, the rainbows out there are awesome. Uh, Halloween, we'll skip over that. I was going to ask a quick question while you are looking through your pictures. Absolutely. Go ahead. Um, I, I am really curious. Um, as you mentioned, we went out for a float once and to do some video work and it was fantastic. And I'm just really curious since you're someone who spends so much time on our waters up here, um, you've been doing it for years. Are there any noticeable changes, whether for good or for bad, that you have seen in our northern Michigan waterways? Good and bad. Um, obviously more traffic. So we're seeing more trash and more stuff left at boat launches. Um, we need to start being more considerate of other angler or other river recreational users, no matter whether you're going for a kayak float or a canoe trip down the river, or if you're fishing. Um, the rivers belong to all of us. And it's not just that when you flip your canoe or your kayak and you lose all your stuff that you don't have tied down, somebody else is gonna be responsible for taking your stuff out. And uh, there's been a lot more traffic in the past few years and the DNR wasn't always, they don't have enough manpower to take care of the rivers and uh, either maintain them or clean them. So the the volunteer groups like the Jordan River Friends of and the Friends of the Boyne, we do a lot of work trying to keep the access sites and public areas clean. 
but uh, we just need to do a better job of letting everybody know that we need to keep the, the reason why we live up here, the reason why we moved up here is because of these beautiful places that we have in our backyard. And if we don't keep them that way, that's, we're gonna lose, we're gonna lose those special reasons why we, why we live here. Um, another situation that I've seen in the past few years, because of the lake levels have been high, the mouths of many rivers have been backed up and there's not a whole lot of flow towards the very distal end of a lot of our rivers. They become kind of more like swampy, marshy back tide waters. Um, so there's a lot more silty and sedimenty areas down there that you don't wanna go wading in because you'll, you'll be wading just fine thinking you're on good sand. And then your next step, you're gonna be up to your knee or up to your hip and in muck that you can't get out of. The other issue that I've also seen is when we trim trees out of the way, because we're, we've had a lot more, the Jordan River generally flows at around 200 CFS, 190, 195. Uh, this past winter, we saw a high of 700 CFS around Valentine's Day. Um, that was because of ice dams. We had a lot of uh, consecutive zero degree nights. Um, that higher water coupled with the winds that we had last fall, we had some 80 mile an hour winds that knocked some trees down. So we had to trim some trees. Those tree branches and tree trunks end up jamming up downstream where the river doesn't flow as much. So there's a lot of areas that we're gonna have to look at in the next five to 10 years with the DNR to determine whether we need to remove some of this large woody debris or leave some of it and use it as bank armament or there's a we have to look at a lot of these situations because there's there's becoming a lot more wood in spots that it's just jamming up and jamming up and if we don't do something about it uh it's just going to keep accumulating and we're going to have a, a serious situation uh some rivers like the maple river um that's still in a healing process from when we removed Lake Kathleen uh, with CRA, tip of the mitt, you guys, and uh, I believe Huron Pines was involved, so was the tribe and FWS. There's certain amounts of sediment that are still rolling through that system that the, the river needs a couple of good seasons of high water to, to purge that stuff through. But again, once you get towards the we call it the Indians or the mounds, the distal end of the river, it gets very braided and spread out because all that sediment gets dropped and the river has lost its channel. So we're seeing a lot of rivers that are losing the main flow that we need to have. Um, I think that's one of our key issues that we need to look at, whether we need to put in some kind of wing dam structure or some kind of deflectors that allow the river to pick up some velocity and reestablish a channel. That was a long-winded side, but that's what we've seen in the past five years. Um, that was a great answer. And we actually have another question that is related to that. Um, do you need a permit to clear trees and other debris from streams? Yes, you do. Um, and when we do it, I do it with the Jordan Valley Outfitters because they're permitted to be as an outfitter on that river they're allowed to do it. Uh, years ago, we used to have to record every tree cutting, GPS coordinates and everything like that. Uh, that got very cumbersome um, and daunting. So they don't do that anymore. Besides the fact that we wanna keep the river as natural and scenic as possible, but we want, also wanna keep it safe so that you don't get knocked out of the boat. Or, you know, we do a lot of night fishing trips and we don't want someone to be sanding up and get a, a branch in the eye. So we trim it so that it's safe, but still good looking. And um, if it was completely barren of trees, then it would be like another float down any river and it wouldn't be as exciting or as enjoyable for me as a, as a river user. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like just to, to make sure you cut out a tiny bit, it sounds like you go out with Jordan River Outfitters. Correct. Okay, and is like if an individual just wanted to go out, is there, do you know of any sort of permitting process with that? Yes, they should, they should apply through the DNR. Um, okay. Yes, you can. Okay. Obviously, just like anything these days, um, somebody throws something into Walloon Lake, it, it doesn't get noticed until somebody calls it in or says something. So there's, 
the state has an issue with lack of enforcement because we just don't have enough COs in every county and they can't be everywhere all the time. Uh, in the fall, when I'm fly fishing or streamer fishing down the river, they seem to be way too busy handling deer complaints with somebody poaching a deer. So it seems like the river is one of the last things they think about. Uh, we have another question. Uh, I'm not sure if you wanted to, to show anything else or if we can take no, some questions. Go ahead, questions. go ahead. Okay, great. Um, we had a question. How can someone get involved in helping with stream maintenance efforts? Um, Friends of the Boyne River would love to have you. Tip of the Mitt would love to have you. Friends of the Jordan. Um, all there's, there's so many advocacy groups that are out there that are looking for people. I know that the Friends of the Jordan coming up, uh, we're not having a board meeting this month simply because half of our membership will be in Florida or Arizona because it's spring break and March is a very quiet month. But we always do a river cleanup coming up on is Earth Day, May 21st. Think so. It's something I like that. No, it's. I'm pretty sure it is. So we're gonna have a, a cut. We're gonna plant some trees on the river, and we always do a river cleanup. We'll go down the river. Um, we also need some assistance on the stream monitoring for bugs, so that we can tell which sections of the rivers are healthy compared to when those bugs disappear. Um, the other thing that we need help doing is we're gonna try to. I'm working with the Concord Academy of Boyne. They've got a, a group that their students are studying invasive species and they're gonna do some work with me on the river. We may put up some signage on how to clean your waders at some of the access sites, but they're also gonna join me downtown Old City Park and do some weeding because uh, our garden club in Boyne City, most of the, the garden members are not, <laughs> let's say this politely, they're not 30 years old and they can't get up and down those banks as much as easily as they once did. So they're gonna come down and help us out and identify to the kids that are students, what is a weed and what is not a weed. So mm -hmm. we're gonna have a, a weeding day on the banks of the Boyne River next month. Okay, great. And Earth Day is April 22nd. Okay. Friday, That's April 22nd. Good. Okay, perfect. Um, I something that you just said, uh, and again, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and type them in the Q and A. Um, something you just said reminded me of a conversation we had, and I was hoping that you could uh, expound on this a little bit. Uh, you were mentioning um, the fact that macroinvertebrates are a really important part of stocking fish, um, and that it seems to be kind of overlooked. And I was wondering if you could talk to the people on the call about this. We, everybody, it's so, <laughs> without knowing the audience and uh, what age groups we are, but um, growing up in the 80s, it seemed like if there was a river that had not good fish populations, people would complain about it. The more it was complained about, the DNR would just throw 10,000 more fish there. The proper answer isn't, you can't, a river is just like an aquarium, which is just like Lake Michigan. You can you only have you can only sustain so much life, and that life goes everything from the macroinvertebrate, all of your stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies, craneflies, diptera, mosquitoes, blackflies, everything, um, all the way up to the top of the food chain, your Atlantic salmon, Chinook salmon. Um, that section of river can only sustain so much life. So when you throw ten thousand pounds, ten thousand fish into a river that already had 7,000, none of those fish are gonna grow because there's no food there. Um, when we start using fertilizers and stuff, or if we're using pesticides, those pesticides get washed down in the river and essentially they're killing off the bugs that you have, which are used to break down organic material, all the leaves and stuff, and they turn that detritus into usable energy, which works its way up the food chain into smaller minnows and then minnows eventually into larger trout. So having a healthy population of bugs, the macroinvertebrates we have, they are our key indicator of the quality and the health of the stream that we have. Um, when I find a good number, and it's not just good numbers of one species, I wanna see a diversity of, you know, we've got 20 some, maybe 40 different species of mayflies in Michigan, 20 some of caddisflies and stoneflies. 
when I find a good diversity of each of those, because they all live in different environments, that means that the river is super healthy. We call that the EPT index, ephemeroptera, trichoptera, uh, what's my last one, stoneflies. Anyways, um, finding a lot of stoneflies, mayflies, and caddisflies tells me that the river's in healthy, healthy conditions. Actually finding blackfly larvae is good too. Blackflies like, they like healthy, clean, cold water. That's why you find them up in Canada and Alaska. Um, so it's important that we don't use pesticides or fertilizers to help keep our lawns clean and bug free because those get washed down into the rivers and will kill off our bug populations, which don't allow our bugs to get big and make it through an entire season. And our bug, our fish don't don't reap the benefits as well. Okay, perfect. Um, you, you mentioned seeing Didymo, uh, and we were wondering what invasive species pose the greatest threat to our streams in Northern Michigan, and what are things that you do in your business to prevent the spread of invasive species? Uh, obviously cleaning and being aware, being vigilant, trying to spread the word. I think those are the best things that we can do. I'm also on, I'm a member of the Great Lakes Business Network. Uh, we're trying to fight the big fight with Asian carp coming into the Great Lakes. That would probably be a really big one, but we've got, we've got over 200 different species of invasive, uh, whether it's purple loosestrife, uh, Phragmites, uh, spiny water flea, the uh, New Zealand mud snails, um, zebra and quagga mussels they've cleaned out all of our water and made they've made a, a mess of a lot of our environments but uh i think we need to just be vigilant be aware when i worked in the restaurant and i i talked to people about what asian carp were a lot of people from chicago that would come up to northern michigan had zero idea that asian carp grew to enormous sizes and they would have they could reproduce hundreds of thousands of babies a year and they have no natural predation and they would propel themselves out of the water when a boat went flying by. So I think the average person doesn't have as much knowledge. I, I don't know if it's just because I spend every day on the water and I know what that would do to decimate our northern economy if we had 100 pound missiles flying out of the water when you went jet skiing. Um, but I think that it poses a serious threat to me and the fisheries and all of our recreational activities that we have in northern Michigan. Yeah, when you put it that way, it sounds kind of terrifying. It, <laughs> uh, we, <laughs> it is. <laughs> uh, we have another a related question. Um, aquatic invasive species control incorporates clean drain and dry, but the state doesn't mandate drying. Do you incorporate drying into your AIS control pro protocols? Absolutely. Good call, whoever that was. Um, yeah. I don't ever try to do two trips in the state in the same day. I don't want to be pushing my I don't want to push my first trip in the morning so that I can get done to do my second trip in the day. Um, and if I do go fishing on another river later on that day, generally it's wade, wade fishing for myself and for personal reasons. So I have five different pairs of waders and I can keep one pair of waders at my cabin and those are pretty much strictly for the manistee. I have a couple pairs at home, so I can use one for the, the black and I can use another one for the, the Jordan. Um, it's nice that I have the ability to have different pairs of waders, but you can always do a 10% bleach solution to kill any bugs that you have. Make sure you soak your boots. Your boots have more crevices and spots that say wet a lot longer. Your shoelaces, the tongue of your boot. Um, and everybody talks about the anchors and how anchors can trans transfer invasive species. I think people are overlooking anchor lines because anchor lines generally stay wet a lot longer and you pull them up into your boat and they have darker spots where they can stay hidden without direct sunlight. So I think we need to make a bigger effort to sanitize, clean and dry our, our anchor lines as well. Okay, those are wonderful tips. We have another question. Have you noticed warming waters and shifting fish communities like more browns, fewer brookies, or others? 
Yes. Um, and I haven't noticed actual fewer brookies, but I have noticed more browns in areas that were predominantly brook trout in previous years. Um, so the, the Black River is a brook trout fishery. I've never caught a brown out of there, but the Upper Jordan used to be solely a brook trout fishery. But um, I've caught some decent sized browns in the upper stretches. They get through the beaver dams. That's just what fish do. But I've also noticed in our summertime temperatures, um, I've wet weighted the Jordan and it was not as cold in the upper stretches in August as it should be. And then I dip my toes in the uh, the Boyne on the way home off of 31. And that water is definitely 10 degrees cooler than the Jordan is. Mm -hmm. um, it is spring fed and coming right out of the, the Antrim uh, plateau right there. It's all very cold. But I also think that the DNR and anglers like myself all take the, the 70 degree pledge. So we don't fish if the water temperature is approaching 70 degrees and most of us say 68 because if you go fishing with clients and they catch a fish water temperature is 68 there's not enough dissolved oxygen for that fish the fish will fight and when you will release it and you'll think that the fish is fine but that fish has built up high levels of atp in its blood and muscle system and they generally don't recover they will go to a spot and they won't they'll die it's kind of like you running a marathon mm -hmm. in 120 degree heat you might be able to make it, but you're not going to be very well afterwards. So okay. the DNR is considering trying to institute uh, hoot owl restrictions. Um, and a lot of outfitters and shops will do that where we don't fish during the day from 10 o'clock in the morning until seven o'clock at night. We won't take clients out. We're going to wait till the evening hours when the water temperature is dropping, or we're going to do very early morning, like five in the morning fishing trips because that's when the water temperature is the coolest. The water is not getting direct solar impact. We're fortunate here in Northern Michigan that most of our rivers, because they're flowing north, the Jordan, the Sturgeon, the Pigeon, that northerly flow means that the tree cover that we have doesn't allow direct solar heat radiation to hit that water for more than a couple hours a day. Uh, where you look at other rivers like the Manistee, the Asavo, the PM, the Jordan, the, or the Grand River, those are east-west rivers because they either dump into Lake Michigan or Lake Huron. So half of that river sees sunlight for half of the day. It doesn't have a chance to ever cool down. It's being direct solar radiation heat all day long. That's why when you float the, the Manistee, the left side of your body gets burnt. If you float the Asavo, the right side of your body gets burnt. If you float the Jordan, the only part of your body that gets any sun is the back of your neck or your elbows. So um, those are small things. You have to think about how our section of Michigan was formed and it was all by the glaciers as the glaciers receded. You look at the uh, East Bay and West Bay over by Traverse City, Torch Lake, Burt, Mullet, Lake Charlevoix. They're very deep, long, skinny lakes. Uh, East Bay and Traverse City reaches 580 feet depth. Uh, Torch Lake is close to 300, maybe even 400. Uh, Lake Charlevoix hits 200 feet deep. These, these things didn't happen by accident and the rivers that flow into them are just the precipices of that glacier as it was receding and digging out of our landscape. So it's, we are lucky to be where we are because of our history and the geology and how this land was formed. Oh, that was a really incredible encyclopedic answer. Uh, thank you for that. I'm I'm kind of curious, just knowing that we have so many people coming up to the area. Um, you know, do you find that a lot of people who use services from True North Trout are coming from out of town? Like, and do they know any of this kind of glacial history or the amount of work that goes into protecting the area? Or do you find yourself having to do a lot of education? I do. Um... So a lot of clients, uh, whether they're Detroit, Ann Arbor, Chicago, Grand Rapids, look at Lake Charlevoix, you know, let's say 80% of those homes four years ago were unoccupied. Now we've got close to 80% of those homes are occupied year round because people from Indianapolis decide to stay up here. They don't have to work from home or they can work from home. They don't have to be in Indianapolis anymore. Uh, so they weren't aware of our geology and area and why this area became what it was. Um, 
having the opportunity to float down rivers with rafting trips or fishing trips gives me that that chance to do exactly what we're doing right now. And I think more people, I think more people find it interesting when they go down the river and they're actually in the situation and they're like, huh, I never really mm -hmm. thought of it that way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we have another question. Are felt souls illegal or just ill-advised? <laughs> they're highly frowned upon, um, <laughs> but I don't think that in all honesty, they're that bad, okay? And, and let me finish this one out. I think that was an industry kick that either Sims or Orvis kicked out there so that people had to go out and buy new boots. Um, there's just as many other spots on your boot that are very porous and, and will hold water for, for 24 hours to keep an invasive species alive, just like the tongue of your boot, the inside of your, you know, underneath the, the flap where the laces go, that, that crevice does the exact same thing as your sole of your boot. Um, so they are allowed again, they're back, but not very many people buy them. Uh, it seemed like when I was growing up in the 80s, felt sole were the main option and they came on every boot, whether you had boot foot or you had uh, slip on over waders like the big waders neoprene style. Because if you were if you were salmon fishing or if you're fishing a rocky river that had any kind of algae bottom that was really slippery on the rocks. So a lot of the older guys would always tell you to get felt soles because you could grip the bottom better. Uh, these days with Vibrax and all these other types of Omnitrack soles that different boot manufacturers are making, you can get a better traction with a um, whatever Sims sole without getting studded boots. I'm so glad you understood what that meant. Um, I had a question. Can you, in the next three or four minutes, I've, I've been wanting to ask this question, but I wanted to make sure to, that nobody else had another question. Can you tell us about your most epic Northern Michigan fishing adventure? There's a lot. Um, a couple years ago, I did an episode with, uh, mm -hmm. we filmed with Das Boat with a meat eater and we had a, it was a very difficult week because it rained and it was, you can look it up, look up Das Boat Fishing Northern Michigan. Um, but I think the, the most epic adventure I had, and there's been so many because so many different <laughs> clients, you know, you work with them really hard and they don't catch a fish their first trip and they're, they're kind of disappointed and they get down on themselves and you go out again and they still don't get it. Then they finally put the practice in and all the stars align. They, they get a fish and it's, it's an 18 inch fish and it's the best, it's the best moment of your life. And it, it all makes sense. But I think for me, um, my little girl Camille loves, she's eight and she loves going down to the Manistee with us. And she just loves going dad let's go down the river and see if the bugs are happening she wants to see if the mayflies are hatching so i'll take her down there and she she has zero fear of the bugs she ha doesn't have a, a fear of the night she wants to be out there hunting uh glow in the dark mushrooms and all that kind of stuff so this summer her and i are going to do a night trip and we're going to see if we can't hook her into a big fish um but i did one trip a long time ago on the upper jordan uh my buddy jake and i jake is in Gaylord and we were fishing and it was early May. It was the first 80 degree day in May. It was before Memorial weekend. We were way above the hatchery and uh, it looked like big cotton seeds were floating down the river and we didn't know what they were. And all of a sudden the fish were slurping them up because they started to fly away. They were a, a type of hex hatch, the red hex, Ray Curvata limbata or hexagenia recurvatas and uh i hooked into it. he caught a couple of decent browns they were 15 16 inches and i thought they were going to be big brookies and then i saw a big slurp on the other side of the river and i cast over there hooked into a fish it made a big swirl i lost it came home all night long the the visual of that fish swirling and breaking my line kept replaying in my mind because we were using three weights, which is a smaller rod. I went back the next night with a five weight and a bigger box of fly with a box of flies that were bigger, more hex size 
and I caught the fish and it was a 24 inch brown and it was it was a night that I'll never forget just because it was it was well earned and it was right where that fish was supposed to be and I let him go and I wrote an article on my True North Trout blog um, thinking about whether I should have brought that fish home or should I let him go if I let that fish go Every time I go there, that fish is still alive in my mind, and I'm always going to be remembering that fish and trying to catch that fish. If I if I would have brought them home, and this goes for a lot of clients that ask if they can bring fish home. When we bring a fish home, it's not so much the conservation as it is if I let that fish go. Every time I go by with another client, they're going to cast and cast because I keep telling them that there, there's a big fish there. If you bring the fish home there's 0% chance anybody can ever catch that fish again. So there's, we try to keep that memory alive and that's what we're focused on. That was a lovely story to take us out on. Thank you so much. You are a yeah. wealth of knowledge and we appreciate you being with us. Um, I'm Thanks. gonna send out, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, my presentation wasn't there for you. <laughs> it's okay. I will work on it. It was a lot of fun to ask you questions, so I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to be sending out a lot of links to all of you, so don't worry if you didn't catch something. Um, if you have a question, go ahead and contact us at info, I-N-F-O, at watershedcouncil.org, and I can send those questions along. Um, but thank you so much, and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Have a great day. All right. Bye-bye.